It all began in the 1600s, when intrepid British pioneers set sail for a primitive land inhabited by barbarous natives. Ireland. It was under King James I that Ireland was first systematically settled by Britons, most ambitiously in the north. Nowadays, we think of this as the start of Ulster's troubles. But James's advisers saw British settlement as the answer to Ireland's instability. The Irish natives, they claimed, were weeds, and Catholic weeds at that. The new settlers would be good corn. It would be a kind of social gardening. The buzzword was plantation. In theory, plantation was just another word for colonisation, the ancient Roman practice of establishing settlements of loyal subjects out there on the political margins. But in practice, the plantation of Ulster implied what we today call ethnic cleansing. From the very beginning, the plantation of Ulster was based on systematic, state-sponsored theft. Detailed survey maps spelt out how the native Irish were to be expelled from the best land to make way for British settlers. This was a business proposition. Public-private partnership, Jacobean style. The Crown provided the land, but it was commercial corporations like the City of London who took the risk, investing their cash in the infrastructure of settlement, the Protestant churches and fortifications. These are the walls of Derry, or London Derry as it was renamed in 1610. The defences were shaped like a shield to protect the new Protestant community planted here by the city of London. Catholics had to live beyond the walls, down there in the bogside. Nothing illustrates better the ethnic segregation implicit in the policy of plantation. You were either on the inside or on the outside. Inevitably, there was resistance. In 1641, the Ulster Catholics revolted. <laughs> Thousands of Protestants were slaughtered in what one contemporary called a fearful tempest of blood. But the plantation refused to be uprooted. Indeed, it soon began to flourish economically. By the 1700s, Belfast was a boom town. Britain's first colony was here to stay. So Ireland was the experimental laboratory of British colonization, and Ulster was the prototype plantation. What it showed was that empire could be built not only by military conquest, but by settlement, by migration. Now the challenge was to export the model further afield, not just over the Irish Sea, but across the Atlantic. For nearly half its existence, the nation now known as the United States was British. It sprang from the imperial model of plantation. Expectations of Virginia, as Sir Walter Raleigh had named the eastern seaboard around Chesapeake Bay, were high. One poet called it Earth's only paradise. New arrivals came here not to get rich quick and go back home. They came to stay and put down roots. But there was a problem. Virginia was thousands of miles further away than Ireland and agriculture had to be started there from scratch. The settlers had the further misfortune to establish their first plantation on a malarial swamp. There's not a great deal left of Jamestown, Virginia, but it was Britain's first permanent colony in America. Back in 1607, the pioneers had a pretty hellish time of it. Malaria, yellow fever, plague, 
meant that after just a year, only 38 of the original 100-strong force were left alive. For 10 years, Jamestown and the future of Britain's American empire teetered on the verge of extinction. Just under three quarters of all British immigrants in the 18th century were either Scots or Irishmen. It was men from the impoverished periphery of the British Isles who had the least to lose and the most to gain from selling themselves into servitude. But there were some parts of the empire where even the toughest Scots couldn't go the distance. From 1764 until 1779, the parish of Olney in Northamptonshire was in the care of John Newton, a devout clergyman and composer of one of the world's best-loved hymns. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Most of us at one time or another have heard or even sung that most famous of Newton's only hymns. But what's really amazing is that the man who wrote those pious lines was for six years a highly successful slave trader, shipping hundreds of Africans across the Atlantic from Sierra Leone to the Caribbean. We today are of course repelled by slavery. What we find hardest to understand is why a Christian like Newton wasn't. But Newton justified slavery to his wife Mary by denying that his African prisoners had any understanding of religion, love or liberty. So if the very everyday things of life are being taxed to the point where every day is difficult, you are going to eventually rebel. You are going to revolt because the taxes are revolting. Many Tourists are still taught the story of the American Revolution in terms of unjust taxes. But on close inspection, the real story is one of taxes repealed, not imposed. The British couldn't have been more conciliatory. On all the economic issues, they were willing to compromise. Most people assume the celebrated Boston Tea Party of 1773 was a protest against overpriced tea. But in fact, after an easing of British duties on the East India Company, tea in New England had never been cheaper. The riot was organized not by irate consumers, but by Boston's wealthy smugglers, who stood to lose out from affordable official imports. The colonists weren't being ground under the British heel. The burden of American taxation was trivial. The average Briton paid 26 shillings a year in taxes. The equivalent figure for a Massachusetts taxpayer was just one shilling. What was really at issue was the very thing that had driven migration in the first place, liberty. The colonists weren't yet after independence. They simply wanted freedom for their own assemblies to set their own taxes to pay for their own expenditure. They refused to accept that their interests were represented in Westminster. Sam Adams's famous slogan, no taxation without representation, wasn't so much a rejection of Britishness as an emphatic assertion of Britishness. What the colonists said they wanted was the same liberty enjoyed by their fellow British subjects on the other side of the ocean. All they aspired to was to be transatlantic Brits. American independence could have heralded the end of the British Empire. And yet, the empire was far from down and out. Indeed, the loss of the 13 colonies seemed to spur a whole new phase in British overseas expansion, even further afield. So, half a continent had been lost. But on the other side of the world, a whole new continent beckoned. The British had screwed it up in America. Would they get it right in Australia? The British had been drawn to Asia by trade. They'd been attracted to America by land. Distance was an obstacle, but one that with fair winds 
could be overcome. But there was another continent that appealed to the British for diametrically different reasons. Because it was barren, because there was no one to trade with, because it was impossibly distant, because it was a natural prison. With its weird red earth and its alien life forms, Australia was the 18th century's answer to Mars. There were familiar losers in the Australian dream. The bush, where the Australian Aborigines had hunted kangaroo for millennia, was being overrun. Once again, the colonists regarded the land as terra nullius, up for grabs. Paternalist as ever, Governor Macquarie hoped that the Aborigines could be fitted into the new economic order, or as he put it, transformed from their rambling naked state into respectable farmers. In 1815, Macquarie had the idea of settling 16 Aborigines in a small farm at Middlehead, not far from this stretch of coast, complete with purpose-built huts and a small boat. You can see what he was thinking. If convicts could be turned into model citizens by giving them some extra kit and a second chance, then why not Aborigines? But to Macquarie's despair, the Aborigines showed no interest in the well-ordered life he had in mind for them. They lost the boat, ignored the huts, and wandered off back into the bush. They voted with their feet against the British economic system. It was the Aborigines' indifference that sealed their fate. The more they seemed to walk away from the white man's civilization, the easier it was for land-hungry farmers to justify what amounted to a tactic of extermination. This really was one of the most sordid chapters in the history of the British Empire. To all intents and purposes, the Aborigines were classified as subhumans, what the Nazis would later call Untermenschen. There's only really one thing that can be said in mitigation. If Australia had been an independent republic in the 19th century, then the genocide might have been far worse. It was the British authorities, not the local settlers, who issued proclamations on posters throughout the country to affirm the rights of Aborigines. And concern in Parliament about the mistreatment of Australia's indigenous peoples led to the appointment in 1838 of official Aboriginal protectors. That was one of the peculiarities of the British Empire. Out on the fringes, the colonists tended to be totally ruthless towards the indigenous populations. But the government back in London acted as a restraining influence. There was no such restraint when the United States went to war against its Aborigines, the American Indians. London continued to exert control from the centre Yet by the 1830s, the new white colonies, Loyalist Canada and Macquarie's Australia, were growing in wealth and self-confidence. The danger was that they might go their own way, just like the United States. The American experiment of going it alone as an independent republic had been undeniably successful. Would the other white colonies now follow that example? Would there be a United States of Canada or Australia? In a way, the surprising thing is that that didn't happen. In 1837, French-speaking Quebecois and pro-Americans rose up in indignant revolt against the suffocating British government of colonial Canada. It may be something of a slim volume, but the Durham Report was the book that saved the British Empire. What it did was to acknowledge that the American colonists had been right. From now on, power in the white colonies would be shifted fundamentally away from the royal governors towards the colonists' own elected assemblies. In the subsequent years, the same model would be applied throughout the white empire. The Durham Report was the colonists' Magna Carta. Empire had been reconciled with liberty, for white colonists, that is.